speakers, uh, speaker, blah, 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 microphone, and microphone, microphone, microphone check, boom, okay, sweet, I think we're good, uh, yeah, man, so, um, what was I gonna say, okay, yeah, 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 so, uh, I got this track here, oh, let me share my screen, that might actually help, <laughs> uh, uh, I will just share my entire screen because I think that's... Oh, shoot. You know what? I can't do that because you don't get audio that way. Hold on. Uh, change windows. I need audio. Audio! Uh, uh, okay, here we go. There we go. Okay. Boom, shakalaka. There it is. Uh, so I guess I'll... If I don't know if anybody's watching, but for those... Oh, yeah. Let me... Uh, one last thing real quick. Let me jump on my uh, YouTube channel and just see if anybody's in there so I can explain to them what is going on. <clears throat> um, you're, you're looking at your streaming dashboard or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Just take a quick peek in there. Yeah, I usually got like a decent little crowd of people. Oh, Norm, we got the perfect guy watching because he makes pretty good house music. Uh yeah, what's up, Norm? How's House it going? music. Hey, yeah, he's from the UK. He makes he's got this track called Entropy that's freaking killer. But anyway, okay, so uh, yeah, I um, reached out to Seamless, and Seamless is going to kind of help step up my production game and iron out things. And he did last uh, last time by uh, pointing out all these little mistakes that I was making that I didn't know. And the intention is to just like go through like tracks and. So I, I I guess I'll explain to you seamless like my um uh, I want to yeah. be able to uh pu put out like professional uh music right um and see if you can like help me from like the start of the track to the end and then just kind of help me work my way through all the little nooks and crannies and explain to me like you know like do this oh don't do that in the whys of why we're doing that you know um. And then, uh, yeah, just just kind of help me make me a better music producer. So uh, that is always the best plan. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, let's see, man, I slept hard last night. <laughs> I have you ever taken CBD oil to sleep by chance? Uh, no, man, no, but I can imagine that that would have an effect. Yeah. Oh, uh, before we start, I got a great story for you. Um, so I'm uh. I live, literally live at my job, um, so I'm technically homeless. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I work on the ambulance and, uh, and no. yeah, yeah. And so I'm, I'm here in Texas and there's this big, it's like a rented out um, space, but there's like a few ambulances in this big garage. And uh, I decided that uh, I was going to try and live as cheap as possible so I could save as much money as possible so that way well the reason I did this was because when I was living in Austin uh, I spent sixty four thousand dollars in four years on rent right and uh, I was like that's absurd I was like I never again will I shell out money that I'll never ever get back for to live at a place right and uh and so I was like, I'm either going to buy a house or I have a truck camper. And I was like, I'll live in my truck camper. Well, my boss was like, you can just live here at work. And I was like, oh, sweet. Really? And she's like, yeah. So it kills. You guys got like a barracks? Yeah, sort of, sort of. Yeah. And so one cool thing is I'm never late for work. So I'm like the perfect employee. <laughs> I wake up and I'm like, I'm on time. And uh, uh, also... Um, yeah, I just haven't been paying rent for like the whole part of this year. So that's like $1,600 a month that I can like either save or, you know, like do things like this with, right? And so anyway, um, uh, man, damn it. Where the hell was I going with this whole point? There was like a point I was trying to make. Oh, oh, the CBD oil, right? So I, I so the point is I live at work. And uh, it's it's not bad. I got like a cot I sleep on, and it's yeah, you know, it's whatever, right? Well, I have trouble sleeping sometimes, and uh, I decided to uh, I'll take like melatonin and different supplements to like help me fall asleep, you know. And uh, I ended up um, going to a CBD or whatever smoke shop around here, and I was asking them for like some good stuff to knock me out with, 
and they actually gave me stuff with Delta 8 THC in it, and I didn't know, right? Uh, oh, boy. Yeah, right? And so I took it the night before my shift, and I was like, I put on my little binky cap, and I was like, well, time for bed. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh man, dude, I, I took double the dose, recommended dose. I was like, hmm, better double up on this dose here. And, uh, I took, I took some and I remember I was staring at my cell phone when all of a sudden this huge buzz started at the top of my head and worked its way down to my feet. And I was like, oh shit. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. I was like, is this, is it, is there a mental aspect to this? And there sure fucking was. I was high as shit. I've never been that high before, but I was at work high. And uh, I was like, I'm going to just sleep. Oh. I, yeah, I was like, I'm going to just sleep this thing off. All right. <clears throat> and uh, so I slept and I slept pretty good. But the weird thing was, was it was the most intense. There was like waves of just like weird buzzes going through my body. Never had that before. But then I woke up and I was still high. And I was like, holy shit, I'm, I've am never gone to sleep and woke up still high. And I started to freak out because I was like, my boss is going to fucking fi I was like, I, there's no way I can like work today, like how high I am. And so I fucking, I drove over to my brother's and uh, basically retreated into like one of his spare bedrooms and slept it off. But my boss was like, where'd you go? And I was like, I can't function today. So yeah. Right. You, you know, not a reasonable impulse. Not an unreasonable impulse if you're... Yeah, yeah. EMT, EMT me up or something. Right, you know, don't want to lose my license because I was high at work, so... But yeah, I had no clue that I, I... So I was... One of two things, I learned that I need to ask, like, is there any THC substances in these things? Because, yeah, it's like, I can't, I can't do that and do that. So, anyway... But yeah, I was high, I was unbelievably high at work and had to run away. So, uh, run away, <laughs> and I run. I ran so far away. Uh, so yeah, let me see. Hold on, let me check. Uh, uh, yeah, man, stupid eye. Bam's in the chat. Oh, so Bam, you're gonna love this. Uh, we're getting help on the track. That uh, so I'll play the track for you real quick. Uh, the uh, I have a guy named Bam who did some singing vocals on it. And I'll 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 play oh. I'll play you more of a busy part of the track and see what you think and then we'll go from there. So here we go. That's kind of the gist of the track. Like that's the big part right there. Uh, so, Not bad. Yeah, thanks, man. It's pretty, pretty Matt Zoe Armada E stunning. Oh, nice, nice, sweet. <clears throat> I definitely like a uh, Matt Zoe stuff, Armada stuff too. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I put. So originally I did this. Um, I mastered it with Ozone, right? But I couldn't play it with Ozone because like it's a latency hog. Um, but I figured maybe what we could do is is maybe if you could show me how to we'll we'll, we'll start from the beginning of wherever you think we need to address. Um, but I was thinking instead of ozone, uh, if you could show me how to get the same results with native plugins to FL or whatever whatever else we have. So we'll do it the seamless seamless way. So yeah. Well, 
Let's talk about let's talk about that for a second because when it comes to house stuff like this, like thor- thorough house, mm-hmm. <laughs> the genre name thorough, this, yeah, right, thorough house. The, it's like thoroughbred house. <laughs> that is it's because all the other genres that involve lots of side chaining, uh-huh. lots, like dubstep and uh, drum and bass and whatnot, yeah, have beats that are not completely rigidly gridded all the time. Like they're on the grid, they're on the sixteenth bit but they're not on like the beat as hard as like a house beat is yeah so this means that all the timings for things things like uh side chaining compression any sort of like anything that happens actually over time well now now has no consideration for milliseconds and has all consideration for beat and and like this tempo Mm -hmm. so when you do things like how how long is your release times on your compressor based on the action that it gives the answer is almost always going to be the one that lets the action that's resulting be rhythmic. Hmm. And you usually feel this. You feel this as something that happens. Like if you ever hit a beat and it makes a hole that happens, like you almost subconsciously are adjusting it to make it be something that resolves in a way that feels like it doesn't violate your beat. Okay. Yeah. So, um, the way that, uh, yeah. So then the other, other part of this I was going to talk about is the whole thing about like how what things should be louder than other stuff lo- levels wise okay to create like the palette of power that's what i'm expecting to like make make a master out of um I was, I was looking at your output and it's almost almost descriptively correct it's almost like you know like the base the sub base is lower than the kick mm-hmm. it's just not lower enough oh okay the the, the visual like you're you you have like the technically true description of like how things should be balanced is just that they're not far enough away from each other oh okay in a, gotcha. in a dynamic sense yeah let me real quick play it and i'll like solo the low end so we can kind of see what it looks like because i was after you told me like the visual component of maximus i was like oh okay let me do that so i'll play it so there's the kick and there's the sub so you're saying the sub should be lower than that more that the kick should be farther away from it Oh, okay, okay, gotcha. So just so, achieve that by kick, lowering the bass. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. or lowering, lowering the bass, raising the kick depends. I, in this case, lowering is fine. Okay. <clears throat> um. Yeah. Now, the uh, the rest of the stuff, mm-hmm. like there, the the it's it's a it's a cascading hierarchy where you begin at your lowest lows. You have your kick and your sub, mm-hmm. and now height height wise, just like visually seeing the peak in your mixer. Those things should be the highest things that peak. Oh, okay. Everything else. And like vocals, snares, everything. Less than less level. They can still be more present. They can still feel like they're louder. They just have to be like you just look at them and see that they peak lower. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so I'll take that off there and turn Maximus off. Um, let me start kind of uh, in a logical order of, of instruments and whatnot here. Um, so, so, so there's the sub bass and okay. So to, to recap back on the part where you're saying the, the, uh, distance between the two, um, how would, what's sort of a good mark to know that I'm at a good distance? So it's difficult to tell because I don't, I don't care personally about like the, the number readings Mm -hmm. or insofar as like this is actually at this number and that therefore this has to be so much more or less yeah. it's always a question of relativity in the moment okay. of how far does it need to be to do whatever and the the it's weird the distance you can visually see like the very big toppest peak of that kick hit mm-hmm. versus the, like plateau of the sub you can think of everything else in the song as filling in that crater right there and we had we, like puzzle piece sizing wise it is almost a literal thing hmm. where we have to think of how much level is left to that to squeeze in between these two spaces. Mm, okay. And if that's not enough room, then there needs to be farther away. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> so in the, so far in this track, like what I'm not hearing is like, you know, the seven lions level of like 60 billion layers. So that means that the things don't need to be that far away. They don't need to be like 10 miles of dynamic range for you to fill it up with 70 ARPs. But, oh, okay, okay. So you're saying in uh, in Seven Lines that he he has so many layers and instruments that he has to uh, kind of make a bigger sized bucket to fill that void with. 
Exactly. Okay. And also, the, the individual pieces themselves are smaller. That That's the, the difficult part about doing layer-heavy big stuff like that is that when you're individually making these things, you have to keep present that they're not – they can't individually be overpowering. Hmm, okay. And your your instinct while you're making things individually is to make them individually sound individually the best and that whatever you're working on can be heard clearly from the pile of whatever it is you're doing and that will get in the way of doing something like that. Hmm, okay, cool. Yeah, that's a different – I've never thought of it in those terms, but that's pretty interesting. So, uh, yeah, definitely, definitely making me think differently about a, my approach to this. So – uh, the, the the puzzle piecing is something that I like to focus on, and it's difficult to start because it's a bunch of like trying to envision a bunch of multi-dimensional visuals that mm -hmm. don't really have visuals for. Yeah. For example, um, you can think of, like we're talking about just filling out the creator with the stuff. Like the the stuff themselves also individually has this activity going on, but at the harmonic level. Oh, this yeah. is the big this is the big picture level level. And then individually speaking, they all have so like you know the sub bass for example is the sub bass. Mm -hmm. There's other sounds that are bass notes that are not the sub bass, but harmonically have to have this kind of cratered correct fit consideration hmm. with the sub bass. Okay, yeah. So now that we've picked where these guys are, um, you might discover later in the chain that it's not far enough. That like the, you just have too many things to fit. So then you got to make your foundation a little bit bigger. Hmm. And the whole purpose, the whole reason to know whether it's working or not, is that what we're going to do with all this is that we want it, we I, I use that word plateau, and what we want to get out of this is that when we compress it, we can still tell that there are plateaus. Hmm. Oh, we can okay. still, it's going to get crushed all up to close, really close to zero, but hmm. it's going to still be shaped like the plateaus that we make. Okay. And it's going to work out that way because we make them really far away from each other, and that when we compress them, they're still visible. Oh, okay. Gotcha. All right. <clears throat> um speaking anyway. of, oh yeah yeah speaking of the uh base i do have a secondary base here that i'll go ahead and like show you since you kind of mentioned that it's uh it's it's not a sub base just like a mid base but i'll play it and yeah. see oh wait let me take that portion off there all right that's what i thought yeah. that's what i thought would happen which <laughs> is that it peaks higher than the sub base yeah and the question is, all right, so it's not going to feel right when you do the job, when you bring it down to be lower than the sub base, which you should do. Mm -hmm. But the reason it's not going to feel right is because traditional experience says to mix a track in such a way that it sounds like the balanced version of the finished track, just quieter. And that's not going to work for this. Okay. It's not going to work for most of the modern kind of loudness stuff, but the... The reason why it's not going to work is because all of this power balance we're talking about doesn't sound right without compression. It's going to sound like some things are not powerful enough, things are just too far behind the mix. Like, just listen to what this sounds. So, okay, also, let's talk about our target. Hmm. Uh, open up a citrus, just a random citrus. Okay. Uh, citrus, where Did we talk about the Gabriel's trumpet stuff? I don't believe so. Okay, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, oh. I, it's it's some it's uh, just go to an operator, make a saw wave, and then put the harmonics into the uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, the uni tab. Uh, this right there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh. All right. So scroll it down. All right. This is Gabriel's trumpet. Um, ah, yes. This a, a term. So like in in science and math, when you get when you get words that have like religious meanings in them, what that usually means is what they're talking about is someone theorized a long ass time ago what the perfect thing would be of whatever it is they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And in this case, they're talking about brass instruments because brass instruments are the instruments that almost the closest thing that generates a saw wave. Hmm, okay. If you look at if you put a mic in front of it, you get this look. Yeah. It's just a little bit rounded. It's just not quite as good. Yeah. And it's just the nature of material that is just not as good. <laughs> like, cool. And so here, what we're looking at, the four-year series, just the saw waves harmonic content, mm -hmm. is what a perfect saw wave looks like. And this configuration of levels is referred to as Gabriel's trumpet. Oh, okay. Nice. As in, what if a trumpet was perfect? What would <laughs> yeah. it sound like? Right, yeah. There it, it is. It sound like a pressure wave, just a flat piece of wall. Huh. And that's what this is. And oh. w when I say flat piece of wall, let's, let's, let's take care of what we're looking at. I'm not talking about the, the angled line in the middle of the saw wave. 
I'm talking about the literal vertically flat click that happens at the end and the beginning of a salt wave when uh, the thing oscillates. Uh huh. That's the thing that's coming out at the air at you when the speaker happens and does its job. The thing that makes the feeling go pop, 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 pop to your face is that flat click. Oh, huh, okay. So the discussion of this line here, this visual we see, the Gabriel's trumpet, what we're really saying we're looking at is the mathematic harmonic equivalent of flat. Hmm, okay. So like when you're thinking, you go, what's flat mixing like? Oh, it's just all, all the harmonics at the same level? Like, no, not even kind of. <clears throat> it's this. Yeah. So what we're looking at is the fit, the fit in, of an individual's harmonic puzzle piecing. So that, that lowest harmonic down there, mm -hmm. that's, that's where sub-level is. Yes. And everything higher than it is lower than it. Mm -hmm. And th by this much. This is essentially the, 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 the balance by which things should be mixed based on their register. If you can imagine your song has a root note and it's like sub-whatever, everything higher than it that exists at higher harmonic notes mm -hmm. is, should be this level relative to it. Ah, okay. And that will give you a flat mix. Gotcha. Yeah. As you can see, it's freakishly far away from itself. The lowest harmonic is a pillar, whereas those really tiny high harmonics are incredibly tiny. But to the point where you wouldn't be able to really hear them if we were just to listen to them by themselves. Yeah. But this is the scary part. This is the scary part of all of this. When this is all played together, because those tiny little dudes are riding on the mountain of pressure wave of that lowest sub, to our brains... They sound the same. They sound the same level. Huh. I guess because of the human frequency hearing curve, I guess? That's exactly right. This is exactly for, the reason for all of this, is that higher frequency stuff strike us harder, like non-linearly harder. Yeah. So that means that we need this incredible distribution to make lower things sound like they have relative presence, mm -hmm. to make them feel like they're also there. They need to have crazy higher level. So let's go back to your, your mixer. Okay. Look at the level of your sub bass and the level of your mid bass and just see if you can figure out where they should be. Okay. Wow. I would say something around th there would be my guess. Yes. Yep. Correct. Exactly. All righty. It's, it's, it's as though we're looking at these pillars of level in the mixer as like they are now the salt waves harmonics. They are these. You okay. can think of, we're not looking at harmonics now. Those are just insert fader levels. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. And in your track, you can just think of that as being kick, bass, like kick, sub, bass, pads, mm -hmm. uh, keys, arps, leads, vocals, noise, like that. <laughs> basically that order. Okay. That that that's um things that should be you know progressively quieter and quieter. And then you know as much as this looks like this, we're not going to make a track that looks like this at the end. It is put, we're going to compress the crap out of it, and it is going to sort of distort this distribution. But the purpose of this is that, much like distorting a saw wave, right? Like if you've ever just distorted a naked saw wave and been like, this did nothing. What, what happened, and the reason why that's true is because the harmonics are so exactly this that it, it's not, the higher frequencies aren't powerful enough to, to overshadow in any process, no hmm. matter what. Mm -hmm. So in this, in this example, we're basically making sure that the content that has to survive will and you, you just, it makes the compression on the top just so much easier. Okay, cool. All yeah, right. and uh, for, for the most part, the rest of your stuff seemed pretty in the ranges, like, okay-wise. I mean, you saw you, you saw in the Citrus that, like, it gets, it gets past the first couple of things, and then it kind of, like, evens off. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a, it's a very slow uh, slope towards, towards there. It just looks like the, the low mids is where you know uh it, it's just a slight difference between there and there it's just it, yeah, it's really the most dramatic changes are in the kick sub and then bass and the just low energy area it, it's hard to look at the proportions when they're shown kind of literally like this but uh when if you if you look at it kind of near the beginning there you can see how like the big the first guy drops a lot into the second harmonic and the second one drops half as much mm-hmm and the next one drops half as much. There's a bunch of that. It's a bunch of half, 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 half over and over again. Oh, so is that what that is? Uh, they they are all all dropping uh, half in in. Uh... Well, half the previous amount and the first amount. I don't I don't really know what the relative amount of it is is for that. But it also comes back to come to these thoughts that like level hasn't always been the most linear thing either. Mm -hmm. Where 
the measurement of where DB is and how like when you change the fade or how how actually much louder or quieter it gets, like how how sometimes you can move a thing down like a DB and it'll sound like you muted it, and other times you can turn something down twenty DB and it won't sound like you did. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. I've definitely been there before. That kind of stuff happens because of this stuff. Because if, if certain frequency ranges are overrepresented over much, then the DBs are just hi, like like hi hats. Hi hats are that example of something that like are always present no matter what and it's because their frequency presence is just so limited to the extreme highs that it doesn't have anything it's designed to have the fundamental be something else right like the kicks and snares and things yeah so uh, this also comes down so let's let's talk about like rhythm we're talking about how the compressor compressors yeah have Compa to have the um timing <laughs> uh -huh. if you look at this this curvature you can imagine um the curvature kind of keeping going low and in tones and notes wise mm -hmm. and the the lower it goes it's not actually about a note anymore now it's about a timing a rhythm and levels wise mixing wise like a drum kit has the same logic to it it's basically like a like the the, the, the individual drum instruments are the harmonics of what is the solid of a drum kit okay and a lot of instruments are like that a lot of instrumental experiences basically we don't understand it to be music if it's not doing that huh okay all right. All right. So let's go. Let's go with your going back to just kind of police the rest of the levels and let's see what looks. Okay. Let's see here. Let's. I'll mute the vocals for now and kind of go to my pads. So I'm thinking pads could maybe be brought down a little bit here. A bit, yeah. Yeah. Let me see where they. 24 ish, and then this is definitely it's like at like under 21. So, I mean, I, do EQ on that? Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, why is that? You should, you should put your EQ after your limiter. Oh, okay. The uh, limiter is uh, okay. So, uh, what, what is that for? So open up the limiter and observe the side chain for a second. Okay. All right. When I, it's hard to judge visually, but what I'm looking at there is how tightly, like, how high resolution was that uh, kick curve. Okay. Because the more sharper it is, the more it, it will add sharpness to the sound. It's pretty literal. It's basically describing a high frequency motion, and that and it's, it's got it. For the most part, we, we ignore this because it's almost always in, in direct concert with the, the kick itself, and so it just kind of sounds like a kick material. Mm -hmm. But if you if you do this after a, 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 an EQ, you run the risk of adding higher, lower frequencies, and we could actually see them in this in the signal in the uh, sidechain shape. Um, and so here, go ahead. Turn up the the speed. It's the the knob weight. It's a fader underneath all those colorful buttons up there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there's two speeds to keep a track to keep track of speeds that are too slow and speeds that are too fast. Okay. Speeds that are too fast. You can see like the line getting kind of jagged. You also can see the jaggedness of the signal itself. Um, at this level, we'll zoomed in, that jaggedness is essentially, we're looking at the rectified oscillations. If you think of a sine wave, we just pulled the bottom of the sine wave and just put it up on the top, like this is what we're looking at. Okay. And so that jaggedness of the side chain, you can see kind of being thinner than it. That means it's doing something dangerous. That means it's compressing the thing faster than it's oscillating. And that's what distortion is. Hmm, Okay. When something is, it, when its waveform has changed shape due to the fact that alteration is occurring inside the timing of the oscillation. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I have noticed that whenever, if I like turn the release down really big, it really messes this part up. Like, yeah, that's the, that's the extreme version of what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, you can tell when it, that visual too actually tells us when it becomes too extreme. So do, do, do a fast version again, I, I do can just show you. Okay. Good information. Like, do it fast. Make the... Yeah. Alright. Let's look at this. So, yeah. 
it, if you, you can see how tall that white line got, right? Like it, it was first it was flat near the bottom, and now it got way up there. Mm-hmm. And the visual height of it, if it exceeds the height of the content it's smashing, it will do the thing. Mm. It will make it um, it will be noticeably loud. Basically, mm. the effect of it will be louder than the the source, and that's when it starts getting like, Ugh. yeah. So, but if you can see it. <clears throat> And you like just time it so that like that little that little business there kind of stays within the shape that's smaller than what the actual content looks like. Uh-huh. Then it'll still be chunky, but it'll be within the contents range of chunk. Okay. And it will it'll you know do a job. But we we this that's just for this. But we for this job of doing this side chain, we actually just want to be slower than all of this because we don't really want to be this fast at all. Yeah. And the uh, other th- uh, there's another dangerous speed we gotta keep track of. So let's look up the slow version. Okay. But yeah. <laughs> it's super slow. No. <laughs> okay. Right. So the other speed we gotta keep track of is how fast it rises and how fast it falls. Okay. And it has an angle, and it's a little bit hard because it's tall, but it has a, the angle of it is is a lot more angular and linear. Like it's it's slower than the the fast bits at the tip there. Mm-hmm. And what the problem with it though is that it's not so fast that it starts to be high frequency material it's actually quite low frequency material hmm. and if you have this happening after an eq that's doing a high pass for example it could just reintroduce low frequency bovin oh okay gotcha so that's that's why i tend to put uh eqs after um side chaining because it's just a befuddlement of spectral nonsense Ah, yes, yes, see, this is like exactly what I was talking about, these little things that I had no idea about. Um, yeah, because otherwise you're, you're the whole thing, the whole, the whole reason you're doing your, you know, high pass, low pass cuts just gets ruined. Yeah. Especially if you're, if you're doing side chain on sub bass. So oh. Actually, that's actually cool. I should go look at your sub bass because I bet you it's doing it. Yeah, I bet you, you know, doing the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, I got lucky. I put, <laughs> I put it after. Uh, oh, what's, what's your EQ actually doing though? Yeah, let's see. Okay, good. So this is what you want to do, and okay. this is because the the side chaining is almost guaranteed to move faster than the sub is oscillating, and you just don't want your sub to distort. Like beyond the couple of harmonics that sound nice, you mm-hmm. want it to basically do what you did. So then you you we got to remember. What we're talking about is all speed stuff. It's all motion. Like mm. we're talking about the compressor's motion is being a problem, mm-hmm. and what for all frequency is is just a description of motion, and all equalizer does is corral it. It says that thou shalt not move faster than this, and it's right there. Like you got your cutoff, and so now it doesn't matter because the other the other way to solve this is to adjust your timing speeds mm-hmm. to to mess with your like attack and release settings and whatnot until it stops doing it. But for a subtone. That means doing it basically to the point where it's not being side chained. It just it's too slow. So mm-hmm. you need yeah. to have it hit the hard sharp bit, and then you have to have the have to have a low pass after the fact, as though that was actually part of the synthesis and not like a post action. Okay. Cool. And yeah, that's basically true for everything. Like the low like low frequency stuff, you low pass like this, and then high frequency stuff, you high pass, and then you also low pass, but for different reasons. Huh. Okay. Gotcha. Um, I guess I'll take a look here real quick at the, uh, where is it? Oh, yeah, bass. Um, that's, that's where I'm at right there. <clears throat> that seems fine. Okay, cool, what, cool. What we would see, if you didn't have your low pass there, you would clearly see the, the, the clicks showing up every time the kick did. It would be like the kick is in the signal. Let's try that. Well, get, get. Look, look in the look at look in the EQ. Like turn the EQ on and move your low pass up and observe. Okay. Yep. So you you said you can see the kick in the EQ. Basically, you can see you can see the little higher higher bit, the little the little bump show up around. Uh, oh, like uh, right there. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah, I saw that little umph there. So okay. you're, that's coming huh. from the kick. I thought it was, but actually, it doesn't seem like it. Yeah, it was. It was always on beat with it. Oh, you know, it looks like the snare almost. To be honest, ah. like the timing of the snare. I don't know. Well, I was just noticing that your your bass has a has a toothy four year series. Like it's got the whole saw, and that's not just a square. Ah, okay. Yeah. Which is probably. 
I mean, it sounds fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But like, I'm, I'm, it's probably why I have this problem when I do what I do, because I tend to do square reader things. Is it or is that a square? Uh, it, that's an octave, right? Yeah, it looks like it's a, a, a square. <clears throat> For massive okay, so damn that—that that actually might be that. What the the, the side chain is doing that? That that can, that might be grosser than I imagined. Huh. Um, so slow your down, slow down your side chain a bit. Okay, like, not like a lot. Let's like see. uh, like turn your release time up like just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And play it with the song. All right, let's see. Oops. It's still coming back there, I see it. That's fascinating. It's not doing the thing where, like, the higher clicky... Oh, you know, I guess... Because what are you side-chaining it with? What's, what's to, the source? Uh, a ghost note, which is the exact uh, replica of the kick that I'm using. Oh. Yeah, actually, I wonder... This is probably... So, that's... um. If it's the same as the kick, you could just use the kick, but um, or I guess it's a separate note you can have it on off. That's probably for the better. All right, so let's talk. Let's talk sidechain strat here because okay, this is a house track, and that actually means that we probably don't even want to be using a kick as a signal at all, and could actually rely on just automation. Okay, and purely because the beat's basically the same the whole time. Yeah, for things where that's not true, that starts to stop being helpful. Okay, but, um. Also, sometimes some people just straight up generate stuff that just auto sidechains, like just has volume envelopes in it. Yeah, I used to do a lot of that, and then I kind of switched over to this method. Um, but uh, yeah. somebody said um, that, I don't know, uh, that FL Studio sometimes has problems with uh, vo uh, automation clips with like volume and stuff, and that it sometimes gets latency. And I was wondering if that if, one is that true, and two, when you render the file, does it does it solve that issue? Because it's like, oh, it mathematically knows well, how it's supposed to. Well, right. FL has an understanding of very like multiple different kinds of latency, and I I'm not sure if this is the current version that they've done this, but they definitely they're 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 currently looking into it, or have already done some things to alter even caring about delay from like recorded objects from things that went out into space and back again mm -hmm. but um for just this stuff the problem with volume automation isn't the latency itself it's about whatever parameter you choose to automate so for example if i if i i use the limiters again to do volume automation and the reason for that is because everything in the limiter is designed to move extremely fast hmm. and when i automate the game to be wherever it's gonna go it will go there when i tell it to in particular if i tell it to be a really sharp snap it'll do it it'll actually do the snap job which is particularly the most of the problem i think i'm talking about when it comes to this whole like oh there's gonna be a click in your sidechain because hmm. you're using your actual kick for your sidechain so i think it's it's saving you from that hmm. okay um because also normally when people use a ghost click, it's a click. It, the point of it is that it, it doesn't have the, the low frequency situation mm -hmm. so that you can personally design an envelope for it based on the kind of kind of sound. Okay. Um, though, but, uh, yeah, so you, you want to be careful about what exactly what volume you're automating. For example, you don't want to automate the faders in the mixer. Yeah. Not just because later you're going to want to move them, but then you can't, but because they have smoothing on them. Oh. Not necessarily latency, but yeah. it's smoothing, where yeah, if I automate it and tell it to be snappy, it just won't. Huh. And even though, like, there's an option for smoothing on all automation linking, yeah, there are some parameters that have a base amount that will always be like that, and faders are one of them. Like, the fruity balance is another one, which is one I did use for sidechaining automation. Oh, for man, I'm glad you told me that because I, uh, when you told me about doing automation of volume, I usually use a fruity balance, but I had no idea that it had smoothing on it. Just a teeny amount. Just a little bit. Then it also matters what kind of source you're using. Yeah. Big, big bummer is that the, um, the, the fruity envelope controller is not snappy enough. It's not fast enough. It mm. doesn't matter what's attached to you, it just won't move it fast enough. Mm. Including the limiters again. Yeah. But just a regular automation clip is perfect. Okay. Straight up, like too perfect. Yeah. So you're saying that the best way for volume automation go away, I don't work there anymore, calendar. 
Uh, it's giving me like telling me I'm supposed to be at work for a job I left like three years ago. Uh, uh, so, so you're saying um, automate the gain right here is the best way to go about uh, doing volume automation? Yeah, and oh, you gotta, okay. gotta remember though that, that that knob is at fifty percent right now. Yes, and that that represents a hundred percent regular volume. And if you just blind zero to one hundred uh, side chain on that, it will overblow your signal. Yes, yes, and that happens to me a lot. So let me ask you: Would it better? Would would uh, do you think it's better to use a peak controller? Uh, to control that or just do a complete uh, individual automation clip? All right. So let's talk about when you want to use content versus automation, right? So uh, that's the choice. Okay. Do we want to, do we want to like try and be Mr. Content aware where our side chain is related to a signal that's part of a thing that we're also hearing, which could theoretically make a thing feel more away, natural perhaps, mm -hmm. although. <clears throat> but then... In my in my mind, what this comes down is the speed. Like, how fast does your sidechain have to happen, and w therefore, what problems do you got to mitigate? Yeah. So, for bass, for example, um, in the track a track I'm doing now, I have uh, I split up my stuff into low, mid, high, you know, low, low kick, low snare, and most of the side chaining I'm doing with audio, I'm doing just with those signals, the the ones that are separated and selected to only be the low frequencies, okay. and it's having the effect that yours is having right now, which is that it's not snappy because the low frequencies are not snappy. They take a they take noticeable time to to literally spin, and that uh, keeps it rounded so that whenever the hit hits, instead of it being an actual, it's more like a, hmm. and that um, initially in my journeys for side chains that seemed like uh, uh, counterintuitive. Like I'm not doing it right. Like isn't the whole point that I need to have like the the kick hit zone free of interference mm -hmm. and this comes back to what we're talking about, about frequencies and piling on each other and how loud they have to feel and balance and flatness. Because in the beginning of that kick hit, and like that first actual kick second happens within the oscillation of its bass frequencies because that's how slow they are and how fast they are, respectively. Okay. And that means that when that's happening, it's by itself. It doesn't have, it doesn't actually doesn't have sub reinforcement. So it can't be that loud. It can't, that's why the, and just look at your kick signal, mm -hmm. yeah. like the sample. Like just look at the sample. Oh, okay. So look, look, look at the very beginning of it. Whoop! Look how tiny that is. Yeah, so small. yeah, yeah. Versus the like monolith huge super sub, and uh -huh. then not only that, but look at look at the angle of the sub, like like right in the middle of the base um, of the of the of the um, kick. I mm -hmm. call it. I'm calling it the sub. The oscillation there. That's the base oscillation. Like if you pick a zero crossing, and then you go up the oscillation and the angle go up to the tip of one of those oscillations, the distance between the zero cross-oscillation, zero cross-oscillation, wow. Zero cross-oscillation. <laughs> hey, seriously, if, you, if you, you keep this up, I'm going to have to do another video of you talking all, all your bass vlog to us. Woo. Here, actually, oh, actually I'll do, I'll do, uh, I'll just do kind of what you're talking about here real quick and drag it in there and do a zero crossing. Snap, zero crossing. So, you, wait, let me normalize it. And then you said... So the the difference between where and where? So the distance between a zero crossing and then the, the nearest peak, so where it goes up to the top of the oscillation, so the, that ramp, that very first like quarter oscillation. Mm -hmm. So right there to, nope, 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 the bottom, that guy. Okay. So that distance right there contains the entire hit click of this kick. Hmm. That's like, like that's how, that's within the space that it fits. And so you think, you think of the zero crossing right there as like, a hypothetical very beginning of this kick and if we wanted to play that you could see it that's that's a ramp that's a very smooth woof, situation mm -hmm. and if i want to make it snappier i have to fill the snap in between that space in between the big zero and that first hit yeah. that first whip and that has to happen faster than that and it's it's a very it's a very strange like physical consideration because it means that um like go back go to the beginning of the kick yeah, this this situation, the high frequency part of it, it has to fit within it. It has to be so small and so fast that it it becomes a compression problem because it escapes it. Hmm. If you compress for the, because you also notice that it's a so low level that if it actually was all the kick was, it would be a hi hat, and you wouldn't you don't you don't side chain things to hi hats. Yeah, like that's not 
it wouldn't be a problem. The mm. actual problem is how big the sub is, okay. how powerful the base part of, of this kick is. Yeah. So that's the part that side chains. That's the part that goes in and pushes stuff around. And because it's basically only base, it's slow, and that's good. And that's the end of that. Okay. But if I have to go faster, if I do actually need to sidechain things fast enough to care about the beginning of this kick, that's when I don't use sounds anymore. I start to use automation oh, to make okay. it be faster than that. Gotcha. So that would that would be where the range where the peak controller kind of works, where because it's fast, it's real, it's real freaking fast. Mm. Um, but it's the kind of fast enough that if you get your fast wrong, it can be a problem. Okay. The sort of problem where I, I know that you have felt this. Anyone who's produced music has felt this, where you put a bunch of stuff together that it individually sounds fine, but you put them together, and it's this very like washed high frequency mush situation that you can't make harder no matter what. Mm -hmm. And it's nothing to do with compression. You take it all off, it's still doing it. It's nothing to do with like any kind of distortion or whatever. You take it off, still doing it. it has everything to do with the balance of timing and your low frequencies versus high frequency speed situation. Okay. Because if you move a thing faster or slower than like it's timing, you 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 can tell, and it'll individually it might not sound that bad, but on a bunch of stuff it's all different. It comes together and it creates a whole new layer of noise that you have no control over. Yeah. Hmm. <clears throat> so oh. for content, you want to you just want to care about how fast your content is based on what like technique you're using to control for it. And in my mind, the slowest way, the the, the, la the least like dangerous way is to just do direct side chaining from just the, by the, the sub base and you just make the release time slow. Okay. And then yay. And like slow in this context just kind of means it's visibly an individual line and not very hairy. Yeah. And then after like, a, a, a bit more than that, where you're like, all right, now I want to side chain like this lead sound that's particularly plucky, but it's dying in the mix. Mm -hmm. That is pretty fast. So that I would use the peak controller for. Mm, and okay. on top of this, okay, let's let let's, 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 let me show you an easy way to handle a problem in the peak controller. Okay. Um, just in in there, make a peak controller, and then also make an XYZ controller. Uh, where's the peak controller? Peak controller, XYZ controller. There we go. All okay. Right. So here's the thing about the peak controller and the XYZ controller. The peak controller is extremely fast, mm. and the XYZ controller has smoothing involved. Smoothing global speed. And then... Indeed. And what's fun about these is that it actually does all good. It goes all the way to zero, which means that if you just plug it in and out, you could do automation and macroing, and it'll be correct. Hmm. But it, this also works as a function of filtering. Because we are saying before, all of this stuff is speeds. It's all motion. And mm. like we did on the sub base, we could just delete that extra ghost motion by low passing it if it exists and this is putting on some smoothing is essentially low passing your motion hmm. it's low passing your automation and if you the thing is though is that sometimes we need to be that fast because we were discussing this stuff about the kick if we if we slow it down too much we're effectively lowering its frequency and if you're side chaining something that's higher frequency it needs to be fast and it's almost always too fast but when you smooth a little bit it's almost like a teensy, just a teensy little bit of its speed is is managed better than if you just try to slow it down in the peak controller. Because the, the peak controller, I don't know if you noticed, it does this thing where it won't shut up fast enough. Um, I, yeah, it's, I'm not sure if I've noticed that, but I, I have noticed the difference between, you know, using this for side chaining and other methods for sure. So maybe that's what it translates to. Like what my my big problem, like my struggle was based on this time I tried to link, because uh, I have I have a bass guitar that puts all four strings out into four individual channels of audio. What? And yeah, and that um, I use those individual channels to link to peak controllers to control for like just sounds. Huh. But um, if this were a normal guitar, that would I wouldn't have not had to care so much. But because the bass guitar, the motion and the oscillation of the strings are so slow that it, like, you, you actually started to see the inter-oscillations in the peak controller, which immediately distorted anything I attempted to attach it to. Huh. And, because that's what would happen. Like, if, if you, it, it could be volume, and you'd just be ring modulating something. Yeah. Uh, now, the problem, though, if I if I use the decay setting in the peak controller to slow it down, then I, I, it w I would no longer have note fidelity. I'd, I'd hit a note, the note would come on, and then it would take, like, a minute for it to shut up. Oh, okay. Because that's how slow it would have to be in order for it not to distort. But if I made it fast enough for it to actually feel like, okay, 
my hands are actually playing the sound now, it'll just be distorting all of it down. And that's when the XYZ controller happens, because what you do is you just attach a peak controller to one of these parameters, and then you use this, you just engage the smoothing. And for some reason, that does a better job of doing what it's supposed to do than the actual speed controls inside the peak controller. Hmm. Okay, that's, that's pretty interesting. So what, it, what it'll do is it won't be so sharp as speed, but it'll still happen fast enough. It'll still do the thing it does when you tell it to do it, and it'll shut up when you tell it to shut up. <laughs> But it won't burn up your thing, right? Like, so, like the uh, perfect partner. <laughs> no. a, so, <laughs> I had to do a partner joke there. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. Anyway, I get you though, so yeah. <laughs> uh Yes. That makes sense. The, the this this is a, just a nice little fix for that. Okay. I, I, it makes me it makes me wish that like FL in general had like a like an automation mixer that was basically just the mixer. It just looks like the regular mixer, only instead of putting, like, filters and things on audio, you put it on motion signals. Hmm, okay. And, yeah. Which is it's exactly what you do in analog hardware land. Mm -hmm. You you mix control voltage like you do audio, because it is audio. Yeah. Hmm. It's not audio in digital land. It's separate processes, so that makes it... That's why a lot of this is so weird. Um... I wonder if that'll be something about the future. Like we, the the two the twenty fifteen and twenty twenty was big all like oh hardware since everything is people are doing that more yeah and like I think a lot of people are grasping the benefits of using hardware, but they're also realizing also faster like wow wow digital stuff just, just kind of crazy if if like the things that are good about hardware aren't that much better aren't gooder enough that the digital isn't just what we're doing. How the heck, however, like some of the things about just living with hardware, just using it as things are starting to be like, I think quality of life stuff that people want enough that some of that is going to be things that people who develop digital stuff are going to try for. Oh, uh, do you mean like hardware's like lifespan, like it's it's subject, like software? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Software like, and the actual opposite of that. But uh, the, no, what I mean is like, this sort of stuff, like like considering the modularity of, of automation as a signal that can that can be modified for speed and can be and should be even um, altered based on other audio signals, just total cake in audio land. Like in in hardware, you just do that. Mm -hmm. Just as easy as I have just said it. Hmm. Like in in the digital universe, we have to do all this shit. We have to do all this like crazy extra nonsense to basically build a world where it works. <laughs> And that that's a description of what happens, you know, like in, in like the gold rush times where someone the people are figuring out the things that are good, but none of the stuff is really made to do that hmm. until someone changes stuff. And now there's nothing but that. Yeah. And <clears throat> right now we're living at the very, the very last tail end of the tech renaissance of the 90s where... Um, the, uh, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this like I know what I'm talking about, but just, just know that I didn't graduate college. Preach, the seamless X86 preach. Yeah. <laughs> the x86 architecture era, where, um, all the software we're experiencing is basically different, um, permutations of Excel. And this, like, FL, for example, like, look at the playlist. Yeah. It's just a spreadsheet. Yeah. And the mixer is also just a spreadsheet. And you could basically code this out of Excel if you were that kind of bored. But a lot of a lot of apps are like that, like especially does, especially creative software. Mm -hmm. But I think that like that's a thing that will will change. Like it's that was a, that was a thing that happened as a limit, like limitations based, right? Like old computers, and we got really good at it. So now we're we're basically we lived in this like hyper art. It's overblown, overdone, over engineered, and where we uh, this happens with tech all the time, where we kind of lose sight about like why we're doing stuff, like hardware synthesizers are old like that is peak tech right there like what it is and what it's doing like human hand on an object interaction mm -hmm. is basically solved yeah but the digital environment version of it is not and that's what's coming next i think is people coming up with because well gosh modern plugins like faceplant and uh vital like push the envelope of what like is acceptable process wise yeah. so hard <clears throat> and someone's just gotta do that for a daw I was listening to literally yesterday. I was listening to you and Mr. Bill's podcast, and y'all were talking about uh, y'all were talking about uh, sort of using a lot of like Elon Musk and 
Einstein and all, all sorts of stuff. But like you had talked about how, um, you know, they were, they were limited by their technology at the time, but basically what Elon Musk has done, is like, Oh shit. I see like all the, he's putting the pieces of the puzzle together and he's looking at their potential and he's like, Holy shit. If I put this and this together, I can achieve this. And that like, you're saying like, we're at the tail end of what we're, it's almost like we're at like ready for like a new cycle, but it's, it's, uh, once the our biggest our biggest thing we need to overcome now would be like the like you're saying the software limitations of certain things with uh yeah you know these sorts of things but yeah no it's funny because you you're kind of almost like you were talking about it in a way in the podcast there the other day that i was listening to but uh yeah no i think and also too it's 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 funny you talked about this because when i was at nam like like the you actually see companies like GPU audio trying to not necessarily tackle that exact problem, but I think it's going to help in what they're doing. You know, I think I told you about that, right? Yeah. 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 So it's, it's, it'd be like, in my mind, it's like if Elon Musk was trying to like had these Raptor rockets and stuff and this company on the side, he was trying to like, how can we make this rocket better? And some like, like little unknown companies like, Oh, we just, was it trying to make your Raptor rockets better, but we found a solution that if you incorporate it into your DAW or Raptor rocket, now you can go to Mars even better, you know? Well, or, actually, I, I love the term space age because of this, when yeah. people talk about space age technology, uh-huh. which even now denotes a certain amount of like futurism to think about, but the actual term space age denotes an actual period in history. Was that like the seventies, with... the sixties and seventies? Yeah, when we were doing the Apollo stuff, uh-huh. the NASA business, the big, the big time NASA business. Yeah, and that <clears throat> that was space age. That was it. And we're at the point now where weirdo businessmen are starting to be like, well, yeah, well, we can do that too. And that's how you know, like, the change is coming. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. You got like, well, you got freaking uh, Jeff Bezos and then uh, uh, Ron Bigelow. Who, what Bigelow something? I don't, even, I don't even know. But like no. the the thing I compare it to because mm. synthesizer hardware is a lot like the rockets. Where once upon a time, individually, they were all absolute monster machines that regularly killed people, and then they got better and more usable, more like. Now, and now they're like when I said they're the peak technology. I mean, like they're, we know what their shape is. We know what a knob is. We know how synthetic electrical circuitry works to make an oscillator, like that kind of shit. Yeah. And the making it better than that is just what digital is. Digital is smaller, tighter, more efficient in a lot of ways, but not as performable, not as like analog. Until we can make it that way, and the focuses on making it that way are are built around possibility, just like rockets. Hmm. People came up with rockets in the 1600s. But we didn't get to space for a super long time. Um, but Ooh, yeah, we got, like you know Steve Wozniak in his in the garage makes the first Apple, and like that took him knowing that he could do all those parts out of all that stuff. But then after he did, and then Steve Jobs noticed, okay, this is the machine. I have the knowledge of the the business parts of it, of, of sourcing materials and knowledge, and then I could tell putting all these pieces together that this miracle machine you made can actually be manufactured, mm-hmm. and that that's the pairing of that like tech idea and then business tech idea which is not quite the same but it's related and important and it's also a signal it's a very important signal like when um the first macintosh computer was a thing that was a signal of oh my god computers are going to be a thing because first like you know even that before that people were making that kind of crap just for themselves Hmm. like the, the, the the tech wizards of the time that's just that was, and then that was just one of the first most like you know manufacturable systems. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, besides the IBMs and whatnot, they're all enterprise and stuff. But yeah, uh, then we you know DAWs and things and software and like synthesizers and stuff, and and uh, computers largely have stayed the same pretty much since then. Mm. They've changed. This, there's primary architectural differences, but they all are all close enough together to be kind of considered the same. And DAWs are kind of like that too, where. For the, the first kinds of audio software was just kind of like, oh my god, there's enough RAM to do this. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, then it became, holy crap, there's more RAM. We could do, like, more, like, you know, kind of webby text stuff like Excel does. And 
we basically we've been riding the power wave ever since then and we're just coming up to essentially like the bare ass end of how far that particular tech can be pushed ah uh, okay interesting huh when uh when and, do you think that yeah. uh next revolution is going to occur pretty soon um yeah. i think like there are some people who are like because the, the revolution like I, okay i call fl a revolution i don't know i don't know if that's going that far but it like happened essentially the wozniak style like a guy made it yeah and <clears throat> then some a company was like we could sell this and that became a thing and like there i know right now that there's people who are like have patreons who are who are doing that who are making their ideas of new DAWs that hmm. are not based on the 90s way of doing computer architecture oh wow and well so you know some and, and they're gonna pull a netflix so right now netflix is dying <laughs> netflix is that's uh, what i've having heard a bad time. yeah yeah and it's happening just it's, it's just, but it's not it's not no one's fault it's not their fault it's not anyone else's fault literally yeah. there's no other way this was going to happen they were gonna they they came they disrupted and everyone bigger and richer than them just did what they do and yeah. Yeah. so like now the world is all netflix's and so now every other company is netflix plus they all they are doing their normal business stuff plus also being Netflix while Netflix is just Netflix. Yeah, you, yeah, you got Disney Plus. I mean, shit, man. Even even uh, like like ABC and shit are, are jumping on that bandwagon. Right. So that makes it difficult to be something that's just a Netflix when you're just, when that's just becoming a part of whatever everyone is doing, like mm -hmm. everyone else has. Mm -hmm. So they're gonna die. They're they're probably or maybe they'll get popped by Disney. That'd be hilarious. Oh man, yeah, that would. But that when when that happens, that that's that's what's up for most things like mm. FL and others other DAW software that were like pretty pillory and by themselves like Pro Tools for example Pro Tools even just being able to call themselves that and being considered as they have been for so long is is an example of you know their ability of being a piece of software but also just the limitation of software availability yeah just, yeah. just viable competition at all big fish and eat little fish just better fish better. <laughs> I want better fish, damn it. <laughs> uh, um, and, like, damn, I've been using... Let's talk about old for a second. Like, I'm, I've been using FL since 20, 2000, 2004. Oh, uh, yeah, you started, I think, right at the same time I did. I was using... Uh, question, did you, ever, did you ever go to sectionz.com, the website? No, but they did find me eventually. Uh yeah yeah Joshua Hernandez yeah I was uh I know Joel Zimmerman uh was yeah on he, there. That, that was his big his big haunt yeah 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 I guess they I don't I don't know what happened between them but uh they had like a, a falling out I tried looking up like old audio footage or whatever but yeah who knows um but I know that's where Savant uh what's that guy up to by the way do you know no idea what did you say <coughs> oh you coughed excuse me ate my tongue that's always good indeed lots of protein no idea though <laughs> it's like you might need a drink of water or something yeah one sec all right let me check the chat uh, what's up y'all what's up what's up just seeing who i think it's a bot put out an album recently right uh yeah he had one it was like very video game inspired um uh, I can't remember they all? what. It, oh yeah, they're they're all video game. But this one was really really good. I don't remember what it was called, but I think it was like in all caps. But he's just got this one song that is like, man, it speaks to my soul. It's like, God, it's like, uh, it's like the happiest tune ever. It's so good. So what kills me about Savant is I'm never going to know unless I hear a really specific sound when he made anything. Because huh. once upon, once upon a time, um, I visited uh, BT. Yeah. And yeah. while I was there, he told me about the time Savant visited BT, and he was talking about all the stuff he did. He he knew, and one of the things that he pointed out was that Savant had a, a directory of just hundreds of perfectly polished, finished albums of music. What? Like all of the stuff that we've seen him release is. We have no idea how old it is. So he's like a modern Aphex twin? Kinda. Like, like he, on steroids. 
he's just always had stuff ready to go forever yeah, and it's crazy is always making new stuff too so like you just you literally can never know like again unless like i hear something that's like oh i i that thing didn't exist until last year so cool huh. but like other than that he it's like you especially you're like oh it's video game inspired i'm like yeah they all are <laughs> right yeah <laughs> i i'm just gonna say this right now i think he might be a vampire because uh how, how does he have all that time or uh, i mean i know this if he's truly a savant his brain just works on a capacity that the average man's doesn't so he's got yeah, a, that's just an accurate name yeah just, he's just got a neurological uh uh, advantage like he's like the you know like i've never I, i've never encountered that kind of productivity like i think i'm kind of fast like I'm, I'm nothing compared to that yeah it's it's absurd uh it's it's what i really it's like he's i think th it's interesting so i gotta venture off real quick i think elon musk is a savant i think he's like a business savant but uh i was reading this interesting article that was talking about this businessman I guess he's he's uh, he's some sort of billionaire, and he called Elon Musk and was talking about the gigafactories he was setting up, right? And he was looking at it from an old framework of how they got businesses up and running, right? And I think his main concern with Elon Musk gigafactory was that um, the old way of starting up a giant factory and getting it going was that you know you start building the first portion of it, right? but you don't actually start generating product and revenue until the building is 100% finished, right? Like you gotta put the people in and you gotta make sure it's safety and all this stuff, right? And so he called Elon Musk and was telling him, he was like, hey, look, it's so-and-so, I just wanna reach out and maybe be an advisor to you on how to like make this transition of getting your building set up. So that way, like there's going, you know, there's gonna be a period where you're just burning cash when you're not producing product and your factory still being built and you don't want to go bankrupt right and he's like i just want to like help you out apparently elon musk is like nope got it thanks by click hung up on him right and the guy was like a little bit pissed off about it uh and then he said what he found out was that elon uh didn't need his help at all and he just does things a whole different he has a totally different framework in his brain on how things should be done and apparently he he didn't he wasn't trying to be rude but how he solved it was his buildings are modular and so that once one little section gets built it's already cranking out product and it's it's like that makes sense yeah it's like there's no delay or lag time it's just like the is if a part's finished it's already people are working in there and they can move them. all right yeah so yeah so here's how to here's how to be good at business like mm -hmm. that because okay. that's being good at business that's yeah. that's doing good disruption work mm -hmm. and it's 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 what real-time strategy games are based on this idea of resources, output, building, timing. Mm -hmm. And the tradition, like, <clears throat> I say this because I've just been playing a shit ton of StarCraft. So oh, the, nice. The, this, I, what I, I've, on top of this, I, the last, the last, like, two or three years, I've learned way more about stocks than I've ever wanted to. Yeah. Like, and I wanted to. <laughs> there were times when I wanted to. And I, I, like, you know, because of the whole NFT thing, I had to learn just so much about stuff mm -hmm. and mostly just to avoid all of it. But the answers of like how certain people can do certain things and act like they're doing it on purpose. And I'm realizing that it's actually all exactly like just the online meta for StarCraft 2, where everyone's doing a certain thing a certain way. And because they're doing it that way, you have to do too. And if you don't meet the expectation the way the expectation expects, you're just going to get boned. Yeah, and unless you come up with something that also meets the expectation that the expectation does not expect, and it's rare, especially in a, a old developed set like StarCraft is the oldest shit game. Mm -hmm. StarCraft Two is <laughs> ancient practically. Yeah, what is it? I remember I God I it's it came out in like '08 or something like that, maybe '12. I don't remember. I think the beta, or one of the betas did, but I think yeah. it came out in 2010. But oh, okay. This is, so this is like trying to be like, I'm going to come up with a new chess strategy. It's like, okay. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> right. Like, and like, it's possible, you know, that, yeah. that the thing about chess is that it's that kind of deep. And yeah. that's also 
vaguely the true, true thing about StarCraft is that like it, it's, it's, there's definitely things that people have not thought of. That's why there's so much replay value in it, you know? Right. So because the the stock stuff I've learned, what I've sort of began to understand is that like you know, energy and consumption and physics of things all really relate in terms of how pressure works. And if you could kind of think of the, like the a business market as pressure, all of it makes sense. All of it is just extremely easy all of a sudden. Hmm. And, and then it's just information. Like, it's just about knowing stuff. Like if you know, man, you certain manufacturers are going to do things, certain things are going to cost as much and certain things are going to happen in certain places and manufacture certain things. If you just, have that much information in your mind mm -hmm. the, th the kind of stuff that seems impossible for pro starcraft players right like they they build their base the way they build it up and it, you know i was mentioning all that timing stuff because <clears throat> the, the modular uh, building business is the kind of crap that players had to come up with to deal with meta stuff mm. where it's like we're going to build this base type and it's like okay well i'm going to i have to match your resource output your unit output or whatever and i also have to do it in a I, I'm, but i'm going to build my base faster in a weird denser cleverer way so that not only do i do that but i also get with the, i have extra stuff mm -hmm. and that one wins that guy wins yeah so that's what you're always looking out for in, in business land you're looking out for what combination of how much money do i have how fast am i getting more money how fast am i losing more money and then all that amount of information for yourself for other things all happening out in the world and if you can eventually just get an image of it all happening you can just make choices mm. you can just be like oh I, I want this to happen i'm just gonna all right and yeah and and then okay you mentioned like the the old headset way of things where it's like well this is how we build factories because mm. build factories yeah and then elon's like well yeah but modular and that that for him was, would seem like a dumbass easy step because that's a no brainer you know yeah because he's neck deep in all the stuff that only does that yeah and in, in this and like the super modular way of life and like manufacturing all the highest most crazy detailed information on not just manufacturing materials but just material location mm -hmm. on earth mm -hmm. just stuff and if you just have all that knowledge what you'll notice is that it's not the 60s anymore and we have some crazy capacities. And that means that like certain things that would have been stupid to suggest back in the day are just possible now. Mm. You can just do that. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we, we're we probably going to abandon rockets as technology altogether in like a hundred years. It's like, just because it uses fuel. Yeah, I was <laughs> gonna say, it uses... yeah, it's a huge waste of fuel. What do you think? Do you think we'll have propulsion by then? Oh no, we're gonna we're gonna be entirely um, leverage based. We're gonna do we're gonna do space elevators, weird electromagnetic like guns that like launch things from the from the ocean, <clears throat> and solar sailing. Solar sailing. I like the sound of that. That's every single like literally. You've said like three words that at least two of those words are like songs of electronic music of like obscure electronic yeah. music. You know, huh? Uh. You know, there's some overlap there. You got, I got a, there's a certain amount of engineering, you know, you get to a certain amount of depth and complexity and you're just going to get attracted to that stuff. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Like, what, what the hell else? <laughs> yeah, Literally, right. how does that kind of depth? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure, man. Uh, I also, I, I didn't, I wanted to point out like where the 12, I think hour, I'm not sure how long that, uh, Anyway, whenever a good stopping time for you is, just let me know. So, well, that was about to be right now. Oh, okay, perfect, perfect, cool, man. Thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah. So, well, cool, man. Uh, I guess I'll see. You. We're on for every Saturday, right? Yes, we are. Cool, man. Sounds good. And then I, I, uh, I probably will re up again at the end of like the twenty uh, things because this is like I, I want to uh continually improve and i figured hiring a tutor would be the best way to do that and this is what it'll be man so uh yeah so anyway sounds like sweet, sweet yes. anyway cool man well i was one last question what is something i can work on in the track so that next time i show it to you i can have something improved upon but i i, I already know arrangement is one thing um, but, uh, just something I can work upon to have to show you for next time that I can be like, Hey, I improved this part of it. Add more stuff, more stuff. Okay. Yeah. So 
also when you're adding more things, mm -hmm. we're talking. We were really focusing on this whole puzzle piecing nature and that the Gabriel's trumpet stuff and whatnot. Yeah, and that's all very true. It's all very right, real. But imagine when you're making a layer for a lead, for example, mm -hmm. that that's going to be like intersectionally true, uh, like an intersectional Gabriel's trumpet, where the lead has layers, has layer one, layer two, layer three, and they all just as objects have to be less than the the, the original okay <clears throat> and progressively so so the next one is less than the thing that was whatever and this is where the impulses become dangerous where your desire to make individual things out individually cool will break it because if you have a layer with like seven layers and they're all there it's a lot yeah but if you have one layer with just barely noticeable seven layers what it is what it actually becomes is like this fade into infinity where you do not notice how many layers there are. You can't. You just can't keep track. So it just seems like it just keeps going. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely work on that. Do that for that. everything. Oh, just every give every give everything a whole bunch of layers. Make everything its own trumpet. <laughs> okay. All right. So so right now it's pretty simple as far as like I I didn't add that many layers to each sound. So you're saying like do more leads, more pads, just kind of layer each each instrument group up. And then, and then, but in, right. a, in with, a trumpet sort of way, with, with the with the sort of like hierarchical respect, where like what's okay. happening right now is the pinnacle. As okay. like this is the thing that's noticeable. It's being heard. This is what's up. Okay, so that means whatever you add doesn't overshadow it. It's always less. Okay. All right. Cool. Yeah, I can do that. So, rock on. Sweet man, we we'll appreciate it. I'll see you next Saturday. Right on. Later, man. Have a nice day.